My name is uh, Alexei. I uh, have a small consultancy company and I currently work as a chief architect for a telematics company in Norway called Abax. Um, but this talk is only partially based on my experience in this company and um, it probably has experiences from different domains that I worked through the years because I have experience in software engineering since uh, since I was 14, so it's like doing software for almost 30 years. It doesn't mean that I'm that old, it just means that I started really early. Um, I am organizer of Domain Driven Design Meetup and a lot of stuff that I will be talking about are influenced by Domain Driven Design, especially about the type, type of thinking that Domain Driven Design implies uh, about uh, what we call requirements, how we work with customers, how we work with uh, domain experts and stuff like that. And things that we often misunderstand, uh, especially what concerns customer needs and uh, what our users want and how we implement what they want. So it's, the talk is not really advanced. There are no technical things in there. It's just more about psychology, co cognitive biases and uh, a little bit how our brain works but it really uh, uses some examples from software and some examples might be scary. Uh, however, all things that I will describe happened in the past and I specifically chosen examples where nobody died. So, <coughs> All right, so um, I like to distinguish two words, simplicity and simplification, because uh, although they look similar, they are vastly different. And what I mean by that is if you look at the definition of simplicity, it's quality or condition. Um, I need to move my iPad. Um, of being simple in itself. So it, it's, a, it's a property. It's not something that, that you, can, uh, you can have a complex thing and then you make it eventually simple. It's, uh, if something is simple, it's just simple. You know it. However, simplification is the process. It's you make something less complex than it sounds, or you make something less, you implement something in a way that is simple, uh, or maybe simplistic. And of being simplistic, sometimes, um, although the word um, simplicity, we even have a company called Simplicity itself, um, it is it has a positive connotation. For me, the word simplification has a more negative connotation because we tend to oversimplify problems that we're dealing with every day. So we're going to look at why this happens and what we can do to avoid oversimplification. So first, I want to tell you a story. This is a story about a space pen. When people went to space for the first time, uh, they discovered that they need to write in space and because of zero gravity, a normal uh, ball pen doesn't work because it needs gravity in order to, for, the, um, for the stuff in a, in a normal ball pen to gravitate down and um, to actually flow through the, through the ball. Otherwise, you can't try it. It's very easy to demonstrate even without going to space. You just take your pen, put it upwards, and try to write something on the ceiling. It doesn't work. It will work for, for a little bit, and then it stops working. So then... Um, it was a task, so NASA came up with a sort of proposition in th that we need something to write in space. Um, the company called, um, that was um, driven by Mr. Fisher, Paul Fisher, designed to spend their own money for research and development, and um, they created a sophisticated pen. Basically, the essence of it is that they created it with a uh, a uh, special type of ink, which is very dense, much more dense than a normal uh, ball pen, that it doesn't uh, um, sort of, it doesn't get out from the, from the pen when you're not writing. At the same time, they need to pre pressure the cartridge. So there is a pressure inside the cartridge, it's, it's sealed, and uh, it works in all conditions, no matter how you put it. So uh, it's a famous, uh, patent about the space pen and um, so they spent a lot of their own money to uh, create this pen and then they started to sell to NASA. There is an urban legend. I actually saw this uh, case. Uh, people give the stories 
when talking about agile and they were talking about the opposite like you're looking at a simple problem you try to overcomplicate the solution what was missing in that um, is understanding of the problem so let's see what urban legion says further the urban legion says that clever russians decided to use pencil and it works everywhere so as a Russian, I should be proud of that. So we beat Americans in this simple way. And actually, this is the sort of a gift package you can buy it in, uh, in the Space Center in, uh, in NASA. But however, my point there is that for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and say it with me, wrong. Exactly. So um, th this is a misquote. Actually, the guy is uh, called uh, Mikin. He's, he's a writer. That the quote is a little bit different, uh, but it doesn't matter. The essence is the same. Something that looks really simple for a specified problem, a really simple solution, actually was not that simple. So what we're dealing with here in this urban legend is simplification. People tend to think, OK, we provide some simple solution for the problem and we, we are good without looking at the essential complexity of the actual problem. So this is a typical example. So we need to find x and the x is uh, here <laughs> or here. And there's a second one. Um, so there was not a question. <coughs> the answer seems to be literally correct. However, it's not solving the given problem. So giving back, getting back to simplicity, it's something that is um, a simple by design or definition. It favors, we favor simplicity in design and in implementation. We like simplicity. It's fine. Uh, and uh, easy to understand and grasp the idea of simplicity. Simplification, however, that's something that we try to oversimplify or just simplify. And it's when we go with simplification, we need to clearly understand are we simplifying the right thing? Because, of course, if you ever deal with complexity, you probably know that there is essential complexity and accidental complexity. Code, all code we write is accidental complexity because it doesn't really, we don't really need to write code to solve any human problem. We just try to make it more efficient. Like, for example, people were doing stuff that we do every day without computers. They were doing different things like uh, writing reports, setting pigeons with letters and stuff like that, it actually worked. We come up with a new solution, but it brings a lot of stuff like electronics, um, internet, mobile, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, a lot of software, millions of lines of code. All of that is accidental complexity. And what we try to do in our daily life as developers, we try to minimize in, uh, accidental complexity. So. Again, simplification has positive and negative connotations. So if you look at the problem of pencils, or solution of pencil, pencil create dust when we need to sharpen them, which is not really a good thing to have in space. Pencil tend to break. And if pencil breaks, it's very hard to fix it because you actually need to cut it and sharpen it again. And pencils burn. And this is the last thing you want in space, is something to burn. So did we solve the problem? Uh, well, probably not. So this urban legend about the Soviet uh, space pencil is actually not exactly true. So the real story is that NASA also tried pencils, and they figured out that it's not really a workable solution. Um, the the Urban Legion says that NASA spent a million dollars to create a simple pen. It's not true. There was a private company on their own money investing in research and development creating this pen. And uh, the pens were rather cheap. They, are, of course, were much more expensive than usual, than usual pens, but it was uh, not that expensive anyway. And the funny thing is that Russian cosmonauts also use a space pen from Fisher because that was the best instrument uh, they had at the time. And uh, funny enough, Fisher pens and some pencils and markers and some other things are being used up till today 
uh, in space. And this is a picture of uh, Cosmo Leonov using a Fisher pan to write on the wall of peace back in the 60s. So, um, essential complexity is often what we don't see. It's this part of the iceberg that uh, lurks below the surface. What we tend to see is what is up there uh, above the water, but we tend to ignore like a Titanic, something that is under the water, and we go full speed ahead towards what we see, and then we get crashed. So our software doesn't provide what it promised to provide, and our nice startup or in our enterprise sinks because of the uh, ignorance towards uh, essential complexity. So if you look from, the, uh, from that story point of view, the essential complexity was, uh, what was very obvious was of course zero gravity. But what we tend to ignore is the contamination control, so we, don't, uh, we tr must avoid dust as, as much as we can. We also um, need to provide certain degree of reliability, so things should not break as much as uh, we could uh, assure that. And uh, we want to have quality records, so if you write with, pencil or with pencils for some time, you know that uh, unless you sharpen them regularly, you don't provide a quality of record. And um, of course, there's a lot of stuff, um, like um, different pressure, uh, different ranges of temperature, and stuff like that. So this all, all those things, sometimes we call it like non-functional requirements, sometimes we call it operational requirements, sometimes we call it um, something else, whatever, but it's still essential complexity. We need to deal with that, and we tend to forget. So this is a real-world example about adding a new user, which uh, I experienced in, uh, in ABUX, in our company. Um, the, this, the system was designed very long time ago, and uh, uh, the company deals with uh, phone sales. So, well, this is how we tend to solve this issue. We just create two tables. One is called users, another called roles. We write a little bit of code, just putting stuff in a database, and that's it. Problem solved. Very simple and very easy. However, so the company deals with phone sales. It means that um, when they call a customer, sometimes they can't grasp the email that they dictate over the phone. And they get a phone number, but the quality of data is really low because people tend to misspell their phone numbers. We have no control on that. If this phone number is correct, we don't have confirmation SMS, nothing like this. And the only thing that's reliable is the delivery address. So what people say, OK, we need to solve the problem within the constraints that we got. And uh, what we did is very easy solution, generate username, generate password, print it out, and put it on paper and send it over. Uh, I remember back in, like, Maybe 10, 15 years ago, internet providers were doing the same. So, and this is exactly the result. They stopped doing this for a reason, and we still do that, that thing. Uh, so we, our expectation is like this. We call, they say, I want to buy your product, I pay you a lot of money. So we send them a letter, and everyone is happy. The real life is, we send them a welcome letter, and the welcome letter goes to the trash bin. And after a while, they just get a package. They got a package with a lot of devices. They installed it in their cars. And OK, fine, so what do we do next? OK, probably we need to log into the system. How? They don't know. So what they do, they call customer support. So we have loads of calls of customer support. Where is my username? Where is my password? I always send it to you by letter. Where is this letter? It's thrown away. So. Uh, by analyzing only part of the solution, we tend to go with the simplest thing possible without analyzing consequences, and we don't really... Sometimes we push this issue. So we as developers, for us, this solution works. We don't care. Application support is really unhappy. Um, another thing is, another example that I can give is validation. Validation is very... Uh, I hate the word validation. I even uh, have a talk that's called Validation Doesn't Exist. It's a little bit provocative name, but um, still I'm trying to make a point. This is one of the examples from Goykaj's book, Human versus Computers. So back uh, in the days in the United States, they um, started to provide a feature, I think it's most countries do that now, even Norway, that you can order custom plates. And I have this form. And you can have three choices. 
And imagine we have a guy who is interested in boating and sailing and want to order custom plates. So what he does is putting boating as a first choice and sa sailing as a second choice, but somehow the developers decided to do this. Nobody knows why. I actually don't know why. So you have to give us your choice for some reason. Uh, okay, maybe they have, a t I could imagine they have a table with three columns, so you couldn't give one or two or 25, you must have three. And all those columns, of course, have um, not nullable constraint. So okay, the guy thinks, okay, I don't want plate. I just have write no plate. Nice. The no plate is, seems to be a perfect custom plate. So of course he didn't get boating. Of course he didn't get sailing because it was already bought. What he got was no plate. But this is just part of the story. Here comes the sad part. Because he was in, um, the guy's name is Robert Babu, and he uh, uh, used to live, I don't know, he, I think he's, he might be not living there anymore because of the sadness. <laughs> but uh, he used to live in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, California. California has this law that when you get a new car, you can drive it for like 30 days, I think, without a plate. So here comes the parking inspector. And the parking inspector in California has another validation in his form. He couldn't write a ticket in, in his pad or something. This is paper one, but probably he uses something like a pad up. And um, he sees a car with no plate, but he has to write a ticket because it's a law. And what he writes in the ticket, because there is a validation there, of course, he writes no plate. So poor Robert Barbour started to receive thousands of parking tickets of every car in California that has no plate. And he took him years to figure, or like first he needed to figure out what's going on, so he started to call the, uh, the parking uh, collection agency, which is not the police, and they started to look, yeah, your car was this, and that, that's not my car, that's not even close to my car. So it's a different color, different model, and they started to investigate and figure it out that he has a plate called no plate. Okay, um, another thing is that, of course, um, people are very creative about this form. They need to put it more choices, like three choices. You have to give three choices. So people put missing. So Andrew Burke from Mar uh, in uh, Marina del Rey wrote missing and got a plate called missing. And guess that in, in this place, parking inspectors love the word missing for cars without plates. The next thing is like, Carol Schroeder from Florida got a plate called no tag um, because at that time parking inspectors figured out no plate is not a good thing, missing is not a good thing, so they started to write no tag and they redirected the stream of parking tickets to someone else. And of course the last part was unknown. Poor Ralph August, a resident of Rochester, got a plate called unknown. So all these people, they didn't die, but they got tr some tremendous a degree of unhappiness and had to deal with a lot of reinforcement agencies and debt collection because, of course, they were not willing to pay thousands or tens of thousand dollars parking fees of someone else's. So they needed to spend a tremendous amount of their own time and probably hire a lawyer to fix this problem. And what happened is that someone decided to put validation and reinforce that you need to provide three choices in a custom platform, which had no particular reason for. So. And this is why we as developers really need to be cautious. Why do we put this validation in place? Why do we need to check all these constraints? So, yeah, I have to go through this. So now I want to go to the complexity and talk about this a little bit longer. So Kinevin is a framework uh, created by uh, um, Yes, Dave Snowden, and um, he works with complexity, and he has a complexity research institute uh, sponsored or created by IBM, and he's director of it. So, and uh, this model is very popular. It's actually quite simple. So, you divide complexity in four domains, which is uh, started with obvious, which like you know what's going on, and there is a best practice. Uh, complicated, where it's a good practice, so you can use someone else's experience. You don't probably reuse the code, but you, you can use their experience. 
Complex is an emerging domain. It's usually where we actually earn money. If our company has a brilliant idea, it's a, it's a complex domain. So then we need to have a different strategy, and we'll get back to strategies later. And chaos is absolutely a horrible domain to be. You just need to do something because everything is going to, to hell. So, and in the middle is, um, is a complete mess, so we don't even want to go there. It's, it, it, the, 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 the world crashes. <coughs> Sorry. So I found a lot of pictures about the Canadian framework in the internet, and they share the same single thing. Because uh, although all these pictures seem to be correct, they are lacking a very important part of it. That it's too, so small that people tend to ignore it. And this is the real drawing from uh, Snowden. And what people, is, people are used to miss is this part. A small sign over here. It's so small that people very see it, and they think it's a decoration. It's actually not a decoration in the picture. <coughs> it's a complacency. Complacency is a word that I didn't know about, and I had to look in a dictionary. It's a um, feeling of smug or critical satisfaction with ourself or oneself or one's achievement. Uh, so we build a system. Everything is fine. We created uh, a system that prints out usernames and passwords and papers, send it in the post. It then relax. It's like, good. I feel good. Everything is fine. It's complacency because we either forgot about something, or we shifted responsibility to someone else, or we actually completely ruined the system. If we stay too long with complacency and consider our problem space as, um, as easy or obvious, um, I need to scroll back. What happens with complacency is goes right from here, I need to use this, from simple directly to codec. And that's actually what happened in our company. As soon as the data set grew, we started to experience tremendous issues. And then we started to think, OK, how do we fix it? And then figure out that data quality is so bad that it took almost a year, and it's still not done, to fix this properly, to sort of actually use the third-party security solution and creating user accounts in a proper way. It sounds so, <coughs> so simple, this problem is so obvious, but because we took this simple decision or created a simple solution, it takes us tremendous of time to fix it. And it created a lot of chaos in the support, of course. So why, why this happens? Why do we prefer to choose a simple solution? Of course, we have a lot of things like MVP, <coughs> minimal vibe product, um, Yagni, you're not going to need it, or KISS, keep it simple, stupid. So we try to follow that. We try to oversimplify what you need to do. And what place there is a set of biases that everyone has in, our head, in, in, in their head. So uh, we're all biased. We just need to admit it. And it's very important to actually understand that we are biased uh, in order to try to, try to engage our brain deeper or uh, voluntarily, deliberately, and try to solve problems in a proper way. <laughs> so, uh, Dave Kahneman wrote a book. Uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner. And uh, the, the book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, anyone read it? Great. A lot of, a good deal of people. So, um, if you didn't, do it. It's, ver it's fascinating. It's really scary sometimes. It brings you out of comfort zone, when it's about especially when it talks about financial prognosis, analysis, politicians and stuff. Politicians are more scary, of course. So I give you a small task that is in this book. Those who read the book, you can shut up. <laughs> so we take a baseball. I go to the shop that sells, sales, sells sports goods. So I want to buy a baseball bat and a ball. A Bat and the ball cost one dollar ten cents together, and the bat costs or the ball costs one dollar less than the bat. So my question for you: How much is the ball? How much the ball costs? Just it's a simple question. Just shout out. Ten cents, <coughs> exactly. Um, that's what we see. It's very nice, right? So it's ten here, one, minus one, ten cents. Okay, let's do some math. It's some math, actually. It's um, very simple, sort of second-grade algebra, or 
actually very simple calculation. So the ball costs five cents. But it's not obvious. We follow with a visual picture in our mind. We engage what uh, Kahneman calls system one, the fast thinking system that actually ba make fa fast decisions about how we breathe, how we um, um, look at people, we recognize this is a threatening pe person, this is a good person uh, from the first glance just by looking at their face. This kind of stuff, the system one takes a lot of decisions unconsciously because it consumes very low amount of energy. The system two, he argues, uh, is a deliberate thinking and it needs a lot of brain power to actually start doing calculations and make cautious decisions, but we need to engage system two willingly. So it takes tremendous amount of brain energy or the, the body energy to actually engage system two. And this is system one in place. So we say 10 cents because it's so obvious, but actually it's not. So we need to start thinking and then we come to the right answer. So uh, Kahneman postulates a principle called what you see is all there is, which is different with what, what, what you see is what you get. And um, it's what you see is all there is. It's also called the availability heuristic. We tend to only uh, accept the data that we have, information in hand. We tend to ignore everything else that doesn't fit to this picture of the world. So, for example, people who voted for Brexit, they just chose to follow with one side of things and completely ignored, del deliberately ignored, or un sort of automatically ignored every kind of information or fact that was working against their decision. And um, if you chose something and you have a positive feeling about your choice, um, Despite the choice has been proven wrong by facts, you will still like this choice because you already made it. System one made this choice. And when you made this choice, you will stick to it at all costs and you will ignore everything that doesn't fit, that doesn't support your choice. I have this bias of my own. If I design a software model and someone come to me say, this is wrong or this will not work, I say, yeah, that's rubbish, this never happens. Or um, I will find a way to make my model work under circumstances. I will not reconsider starting to redoing the model from scratch. And this is something we do all the time, especially in software. I wrote thousand lines of code. It works splendidly. Someone points an error in a code review. I say, yeah, but just put it in production. We fix it later. Or oh, this will never happen. This will never fail. I have a bunch of unit tests that prove that everything works. So um, let's look at the how we uh, operate with information depending on how information comes to us. It can work with requirements. I will, I will use a political example or leadership example. So, uh, will she or he be a good leader? High profile leader, like country leader. So, this is what we get. He or she is intelligent, charismatic, and strong. Good leader? Yeah, it's an obvious question. I mean, it's not a bat and ball uh, task. It's, it's very obvious. It must be a good leader because that's, that's characteristics that we usually apply to a good leader. And you might think of a guy like this. But then more information comes for this about the same person. But he or she is cruel and maybe corrupt. Is this person a candidate for a good leader? You might start to think, okay, maybe not. Then you think about a person like that. I'm sorry about fans of Hitler. It's not her, it's a picture of someone who looks like her. But then more information comes about the person that we're still talking about the same person. This will just change images in our mind. He or she is stubborn, aggressive, and arrogant. It's definitely not a candidate of a good leader. And then you picture someone like this. <laughs> so, so the point is that uh, we can make decisions just based on the information we got. If we get all this information later on, but we like the guy or the girl, we stick to this choice and we try to ignore everything else. Just look at Fox News. It's very obvious that there is a certain money involved, but also m a lot of people really like the guy below because they just tend to ignore everything else. They think he's strong, charismatic, and intelligent. Maybe that was because they got this information first and they tend to ignore everything else. So, system one takes decisions all the time. I look at one person, I like him or I like her, 
because the peeling or the, the form of the body and everything else, the clothes, and then you probably look at another person and say, oh no, that's, that's, that guy or this girl looks silly, I don't want to talk to her. But of course, after you spend a little bit of time with the person, you might change your mind. But it takes a lot of mental energy to persuade your otherwise and change your first impression. So, getting back to the pencils. Um, so let's see what Kahneman writes. When in certain system one bets on an answer and the bets are guided by experience. We know that pencils write in space or whatever, uh, they write on any condition, even underwater. So it must be a perfect candidate. That's the only experience we've got. We don't consider anything else because we, don't no we know nothing about the atmosphere in, uh, in a space station. So the rules of betting are intelligent. Recent, recent event and current context have most weight. So what we know is the most important for us right now. And then we make a decision and then we stick to it. So what I'm trying to actually tell, like, OK, it's, it's maybe a repetition. So we know at a given context that pencils work in zero gravity. But what we tend to ignore afterwards, because we don't have a context, we don't have this information that pencils need sharpening, we just forget about this. Uh, that pencils create dust and the pencils can burn and the quality of pencils is much lower than pens. So this story doesn't fit to our problem space. So there are a few biases that are very dangerous. The confirmation bias, for example, is so People take, you know, like a certain idea or concept to be true, and then they stick to it. And everything that confirms this idea will be accepted willingly, and everything that is against this idea will be just rejected. People just tend to ignore. Just not, I mean, you tell the person that this would not work, and he or she says, okay, yes, you're right, and then nothing happens. It just goes away in the brain. So. Once we have a formed view, we embrace information that confirms the view while ignoring or reject information that uh, creates doubt about this view. This is a confirmation bias. Overconfidence is that when we get skilled at something, and this is especially applicable to developers that tend to use certain tools, and then again, um, when you, everything you have with a hammer, everything else looks like a nail. So you try to use, like, I use SQL Server. Now, SQL Server is good for everything. SQL Server for event store. SQL Server as a b b uh, um, uh, data warehouse. SQL Server as a database to store files. Everything goes to SQL Server. I put JSON to SQL Server and query it somehow. So um, as this rule implies, uh, neither the quality or quantity of evidence uh, matters. If you, have a conf uh, if you have overconfidence, you stick to the solution uh, because um, you like the story. System one likes to build a coherent story in your mind, and if the story starts to break, uh, you feel uncomfortable. When you start to feel uncomfortable, you try to stick back to the comfort zone. And every evidence that your model, which you actually built and you are confident in, is, will not be working in a certain scenario, you try to ignore it because otherwise you will be uncomfortable. You feel bad. You start to feel not well. You each actually can have physical uh, conditions that, or feelings uh, that produce a little bit of stomach pain and stuff like that. So you try to get back to the comfort zone because it's much easier to do. So and uh, of course, the availability heuristic. The availability heuristic is exactly what you see is all the risk. So you just accept data you have, the context you have, and attempt to ignore everything else. So you, if you don't spend time deliberately discovering what's around the context you're trying to solve, you will never get there. So all these principles imply that we need to keep things simple and try to solve s problems with a more simple way. But sometimes we ignore the essential complexity of the issue. And then we go from simple directly to coding domain. It's a very good chance that we do. So that's a fact check about what I talked uh, of what I talked about. People throw away welcome letter. People might be trying one or twenty options for custom plate. Not everyone has a first and last name. Good one. Not all countries have postcodes. Not all currencies have two decimal places, and the list goes on. I give you a story about postcodes. It's very funny. 
Uh, you know that you fill out a form on Amazon and say, uh, where do you live? I live in this country. I have this address. And what's your postal code? Right? It's fine. Everyone does that. Every e-commerce system does that. So imagine that Ireland didn't have postal codes. And then they started to introduce postal codes not that long ago. You know why? Make a guess. Because there's so many e-commerce systems requiring this postal codes anyway, ignoring the fact that Ireland doesn't have postal codes. So the country had to change their postal systems because the city developers were creating validation rules to check the postal codes, no matter what the country it is. If you think about it, that's insane. It's a country, for Christ's sake. And you force them to spend tremendous effort to change the system, how the post office works, just because you put some city validation in the postal code field. All right. So what I want you to take out of this talk, actually, embrace the main complexity. Try not to oversimplify problems. If you have a problem to solve, try to get around it. Try to talk to more people. Try to disband your comfortable view on this. Try to uh, destroy system one, because the system one's build a story around it, and you believe in the story. And then you say, yeah, but this story is too good. Something is fishy. Something is missing. I need more information. So. If we get back to the user uh, creation of users, so when we started to look at it, the first iteration, the second iteration is ongoing, but the first iteration uh, was like this. It's not a new problem. It must be solved. So we need to look how other people do that. Yeah, but it's not easy. So we realized that the problem is not easy. We need to come with a sophisticated solution. So where do we look? For example, Slack, inviting new members. Because the only account that we create initially is an administrator account that needs to invite more people. We literally re-implemented it. I wouldn't say the word, but we implemented design, which, which is very close to the experience of Slack. And that's not only Slack. Trailer has similar experience and many other uh, good systems. So we didn't want to invent, reinvent the wheel, so we say it's a complex thing. Someone had done it before, and we just need to follow the pattern and see if it's working. So simplicity is very good for the user experience. Users don't want to spend tremendous, tremendous amount of time trying to figure out what you put on a form with 25 fields or 250 fields. Uh, there is a famous picture of Microsoft Word when you put all toolbars that are available in Microsoft Word, and you have all very, very little space here in the middle where you can write something, because there's a tremendous amount of complexity that you actually never use. To try to create as much simple U UX as possible, UI as possible, but at the back end, you need to consider all the different scenarios. Of course, you can ignore some simple stuff, or not simple stuff, <laughs> some complex scenarios that probably never happens. Because uh, we have guys in, the, in our company that say, that imagine some scenarios that actually almost never happen, that happen so rarely, we can safely ignore them, or we can fix them manually when they occur. This is the model that we built when we try to analyze the pro pro process of this is one of the first situations of trying to understand the complexity of the domain. And this could not be that complex for user advice, but it was. So another example that I want to give is um, like validation doesn't exist. I, I, want, I like the slogans, you know. <coughs> there is no crud. So what do I mean by that? We often see user interface that uh, when you look at it, you see, oh, there is a SQL database behind it, and everything goes like create, update, delete. Create, update, delete, what we know is CRUD. You can just literally see it, and I'll give you an example. This is a sick leave form. That's the system we are using now. It's not ours, but we bought it. Started in the half day safe council. What does it even mean for a sick leave? I have no idea. Start day, end day, is it last day I was on sick leave, or is it first working day? I don't know. What half means? Is it half of the first day, half of the last day? I have no idea. What means saving sick leave? I can't save it. It's unsavable. <laughs> it already happened. I can register maybe it, or I can like ask for approval. It's very implicit. A lot of things I hear that from a developer's point of view that deal with SQL databases with a, with a table with like one, two, three fields, it makes sense. And maybe, of course, the user ready. But for me as a user, it makes no sense at all. We used to have a different system, though. And for some reason, we changed that crap. And they had this form. 
First day not being at work, came but had to leave. When the leave was registered, um, came back to work at a certain date and I came to work after lunch. So this half is replaced by something that has a meaning, that I can read, that I can understand as a human being. I don't need to imagine the SQL table with constraints behind the form to figure out what I need to uh, fill out in this form. And it has buttons that I submit for approval, close and cancel. Maybe these guys don't do domain design, but at least they have a good user experience designer that can tell them that, guys, you can't do CRUD everywhere. You might have CRUD in the back end, but for the user of your system, just make something that, that is readable, that people can understand. So I like this approach very much. And maybe there is a CRUD behind, but from the user perspective, it's no CRUD anymore. So and here is the iceberg again. Everything that is above the water, everything we see is implicit. Everything below is explicit. So, and our, our I think it's the other way around, I'm sorry. <laughs> our work is making implicit explicit. So how we do that? We need to challenge everything. You know this guy, right? Everybody lies. Requirements lie. And not because people that create requirements want to lie to you. They just unintentionally build a coherent picture in their mind following the confidence bi overconfidence bias and availability heuristic. And they don't want to break this picture. They just tell you what they think would be a good solution. Domain experts lie. They describe you how they work now, but not how they would like to work or how they would like the system to operate because people barely know how things work. And nobody knows how things should work. So it's a deliberate discovery process. You need to find out how the system should work to solve a particular problem. Validation. I love that validation. Yeah. <laughs> validation is not validation. It's a business decision. The business needs to make decisions that you usually take as developer. The three fields, mandatory fields on the uh, ordering of custom plates was a decision of a developer. It was not a business decision. What developers should have done, talk to the business, ask them what is the minimum number of custom plays a person can order at a time and what is the maximum number of custom plays a person can order at a time. It should be come from the business. The business needs to tell you how you need to check the constraints in your aggregate or whatever else, even in the UI. Think about this. Can the customer order items that are not in stock? Anyone? Yes? No? It depends. Exactly. So, how we do that? Common sense. Item stock level less or equals than zero? Throw an exception. You can't do it. Why? Because I think you can't. You, you think about your real experience. You go to a shelf in a shop, and if it's not there, you can't buy it. You can order it, or the back order it, but you can't buy it. It's not there. So, what you really think is, if it's a business decision, it depends on a business model. So if it's Amazon, you can do it because they can bulk order because their business model provides you the ability to do it. If you talk about a Dutch company, Coolblue, they made a promise that everything you order is in stock. It's no, no, you can't order something that's not in stock. It's, you just can't. Their business model is completely different. So it's not a developer decision to put this validation in place. It's actually a business decision. Someone needs to talk to the business and ask them, what do you want? So, you need to ask questions. You need to ask questions as a developer. What happens? Why this field is mandatory? Why this thing must be unique? What if this number will not be unique? I mean, okay, every, <laughs> I like Matthias who writes, uh, when he does a workshop and he talks about a business problem and say, this happens like this. Uh, why? Because of reasons. And it always happens like this? Yes. It always happens like this? Yes. Are you sure it always happens like this? Well, I think no. All the time he talks to the main experts, and I actually reuse this pattern, every time we talk to them, something that I'm very sure about, they put in the requirements, will not be true. If you don't challenge them, you will put it in a system. If you challenge them, you will discover stuff that you actually need to take into account when implementing the system. Reports, I love this. 
I have several things like validation, <laughs> reports. How many s people doing systems that provide reports to their users? Okay, come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Most of you do. <laughs> so, I got a user story like this. As a user, or as administrator of the system, I need to be able to generate the report so I can read it. Excellent user story, right? I literally saw that. As administrator, I want to have a report so I can read this report. <laughs> I came to the, to the product owner and said, what, what is this? Uh, the customer wants a report. Yeah, why? I don't know. Okay, right, what problems are we trying to solve? I don't know, <laughs> they just want a report. <laughs> so, why this happens? Because the customer came with the idea and that they need additional report for something, whatever. Because the, they want to replicate their experience from before. The system one is talking. System one is very easy to engage. Takes no brain power to implement. I need to look at another piece of data. What do I need? Report. I need to look at that piece of data. What do I need? Report. Everything is a report. In our system, right now, that we're going to rebuild piece by piece, don't do major rewrite, it never works. We have tons of reports. Because every time people come and they say, we need more reports, we need more reports, we need more reports, and it ended up with like thousands of reports. Because people used to work with reports. They, they kind of have paper from before, they worked like this in their 70s and 80s. And what they want to do is to computerize it. So they can look at a screen and just say, that's a good report, that's fine. <laughs> That's nice. See this pie chart? It must be good. <laughs> what users really want is not a report. <laughs> they want to solve a particular problem. That story actually came from a customer in China that wanted to track their uh, uh, railroad wagons, cars, going in and out of geofence area. So what they used to have, they used to have guys on every railway, railway track. It's not a normal road, so the train can only go on railway tracks. So you can put, like, a, there is an area. There are maybe five railroads that go in and out of this area. You can put five guys. They will count cars, make pictures, whatever. What they do, they enter it in the, in the system, and the system, what does? It produces a report. First, it was on paper. Then it was computerized, so they got pads, maybe they can scan numbers. But the result is the same. A big boss in the company comes in the morning, and there is a big sheet of paper like this. So, ah, that's a good report. I'll look at it. So what I wanted from us is that we track cars moving in and out from the geofence area and produce exactly the same report. Why? Because they used to have the same solution. They just want to automate it as much as they can. What the customer really wanted they want to be notified when something that's not allowed to happen, happens. And it happens when? Now and then. It happens maybe once a week. But now they spend a lot of time and a lot of people. That's good for an employment solution, problem solution. So just put a lot of people doing these reports or counting cars or whatever. The big bosses actually will lose the job if we automate it to the extent that they will be just notified when something happens, the deviation. Reports, as Udi Dehan puts, Reports are only used to find out deviations. It's just people so used to find out deviations by look, comparing the old report with the new report that they couldn't figure out any other way of doing this. But with uh, machine learning, all this artificial intelligence, we have tens of mo tens of flow, a lot of models, we can find deviations like this, especially when it's a simple thing, cars moving in and out, geofence area, it, it takes no time. But this story comes As administrator, I want a report so I can read a report. And again, if you find stories like this, really come to the, your product owner and say, what is the problem the customer tries to solve? Say, it's not your business. It is my business. I want to provide quality solution because I'm not silly code monkey. I'm a qualified developer that wants to solve a problem of a real customer. I don't want to create this bloody report. Just give me some real work that I can help people. So, assumptions is another enemy of us, of ours. So, let's look at this thing. You know what's that? 
this geographic uh, database detecting IP addresses, so location of IP address, is driven by a company, the, the, the biggest company in the world that's called MaxMind. So some people called Teresa and James Arnold, they started the big litigation with this company, MaxMind. Why? Because at some point in time, a lot of people started to threaten them, saying, we won't kill you. You are bloody bastards. You, what are you doing? I mean, you're selling drugs. You are pedophiles. You are just doing all the crimes in the world. So why does this happen? Because MaxMind has a nice feature of a map. If you put IP address, they can put it on the map. So these guys that sell drugs and sell child porn and all this illegal bank transaction, everything, they are quite clever. They usually use IP addresses that you can't map. So what MaxMind does when you put IP address that they can't find out the location? Make a guess. They find a geographical center of the area and put the point on the map in there, like that. And guess where this bloody Arnold and James, or Arnold's family live? In the geographical center of the United States. Over here. That's a clever solution. We, we, they assume that that's a good thing to do. It's like United States, where we put the point? In the middle. That's what happened. That's called digital hell. There's a famous story. You can read about it in the internet. I think there isn't even a wiki article about this. Analogs were suing MaxMind. I don't know what, the, I think the case is still ongoing. Someone drew to this place. It's in the middle of nowhere and left a broken toilet in the middle of their driveway. They really got scared. I mean, that's, that, that like, scare, really scary people can have very scary ideas about what to do with these poor souls. And they did nothing. There is, there is no crime. But they got a lot of threats and stuff like that. So the story is maximized, a lot of stories. In the middle of the state, in the middle of the country, in the middle of a region, in the middle of the block, police raids and everything. So what happened with Max Mines? They changed the routine. So they couldn't change the system. But they tried to put this point explicitly now, and it should be like in a lake. So there is no one in a lake. So people know that no one lives there. So yeah, it is kind of a solution. It's, it's workable. We call it workaround, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatic solution. So unless someone builds a, a water house in the middle of the lake, it will, it will be OK. So a couple of years. These guys can relax. So, and also, uh, if we talk about biases again, um, we can look at this kind of sad video. I hope it works. Sorry, just try to click on it. Ah, oh, okay. I'm sorry. It was working before, but the video is that um, uh, it's in South Africa. There is a soap dispenser and. Uh, uh, the white hand puts it's put on underneath, and the soap comes, and then the black hand put, and it doesn't work. So they try several times. It's, it's they call it a racistic soap dispenser. So people who design a soap dispenser were under assumptions that only people around them can reuse it, and they completely forgot about people of different races. So they were biased, and they made assumptions that are practically wrong. So what we can do to avoid this? Let me. Just scroll through it. So if you want to avoid being biased and you want to avoid assumptions because you have a very limited group of people and usually you work as a closed group and you solve a certain problem, you can decorrelate error. What does it mean? It's known that if people are put, uh, like there is an experiment uh, psychological experiment. Uh, they put a lot of pennies in pennies, pennies, sorry, pennies <laughs> in the jar, and put this uh, jar on the on the on the desk, and uh, they ask people how to estimate how many uh, money is in in the jar. The individual responses were horrible. I mean, nobody can really estimate. But when we ask group of people, they were. Uh, amazingly accurate as an average of a group. So as a, as a group, as a group of people, a group of individuals, we can 
come up with a better solution because the bad estimations will be overweight by good estimations. Or like you underestimate, some guy overestimate, and we come to the middle. And the middle ground is OK. It's very, very nice. It's, it's in a very good range. However, if they put the group of people together to look at the jar, it doesn't work anymore because they influence. The per first person says it's maybe $10, and everyone says the figure around this number because they got what's called bandwagon. So they, they, got, they think maybe this person is right and estimate around this number. They don't want to go really far away, like $20, $30. They will try to be within this number. So when we work with meetings, and this happens in our company as well, it happens in all the companies, usually people come with to, to meet and discuss a certain topic. So let's work on the solution for that particular problem. Nobody prepares. Do you, have company, do, do you work in a company where people come prepared to the meeting? Anyone? Yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Usually people, OK, what are we discussing? Oh, we discussed that. So we spend half an hour just talking about what we need to solve. And then we say, how we solve it? We have not much time left, so let's hurry. OK, someone stands up. And uh, for example, if the, it's me there in the room, I'm chief architect. Everyone look at me and say, I think we need to solve it this way. Everyone says, OK, fine, let's go. Let's go have a beer. Or let's have a lunch. We're all hungry. So it's a bandwagon effect. Everyone is dragged with this decision. Everyone is, likes it because I put a nice coherent story around it, of course. And uh, then it's solved. Problem solved, everyone goes home. So the solution for that is if you can describe your problem up front and you can send it in a meeting, like an in invitation, and say, we're going to solve this problem. Please come up with suggestions. Please come up with something that we can discuss. And people come prepared with the notes. And everyone is obliged to read their notes. Otherwise, they can just cancel the meeting. And then probably you will be able to decorrelate the error. So this is a technique that you can use. Another thing is, of course, visualization. If someone comes to my room and tries to explain with words that are vogue and ambiguous to me, and I don't understand the domain, I need to do a lot of context switching in my head to deliberately dive into the problem. Otherwise, I will provide them a very strange solution. So I prefer to visualize it. Let's put it on the wall. Let's put it on the board. Let's try to draw and fi find out what components we're talking about, what data we're talking about, and stuff like that. Visualization is a very powerful technique. Um, when, when we moved to a new office, I proposed to put a lot of whiteboards, and everyone has access to the whiteboard. And they're all nice, and we have a lot of pens. And uh, exploration is a powerful technique. Uh, exploration uh, is different from, for example, uh, uh, distillation. So there are two ways of uh, finding out the best solution, and one of those is um, distillation. So you find a, find a good solution, you have an idea, and then you distill it until you get a final solution. In iterations, we do Agile, right? But if <laughs> the best solution is somewhere there, you didn't even look at it, you haven't considered that. The so first phase would be not to take the good idea and the first design you came with and distill it. The solution or the, the good approach would be just to give different people the task to explore this issue and try to come up with different solutions. And then you find out which is preferable. And then you can explore even more. And then you probably will come to a best solution. But if you just distill one single thing, you probably will never hit a best solution. And in domain driven design, we have this uh, slogan, throw away the model. And this actually demonstrates what we're trying to do. If we come up with a solution, with a model, we need to reconsider it. Eric Evans says that you need to come up at least with three models. Of course, we have a bandwagon effect. We have a nice coherent story system one likes to work with from the first model. We like it so much, we never want to throw it away. So maybe it's a good idea to have three different groups of people to design it very, on a very high level and then try to convert it. So first diverge and then converge. And that would work. Of course, the management could say, yeah, I mean, instead of two with we'll six people working this problem, yeah, of course, you know, saving this precious hours of planning in favor of very cheap months of development. I mean, this is just, uh, this is how management works. So, end of my talk and about end of the hour, uh, this is what ADD is, technical complexity in the heart of software. 
we need to find what complexity really is and we need to so solve that instead of solving imaginary problems or solving a completely different problem, like a report for something that customer doesn't really want to report about and other things. So people say this Albert Einstein, so I am not sure. <laughs> I had to find in the Wikipedia. I couldn't find the author of this quote. Everything must be made as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. <laughs> so and uh, this has the references, Thinking Fast or Slow. If you haven't read this book, please read it. Human versus Computers contains a lot of scary stories. People die from software. People get punished wrongly by software. People get their security payments or social payments denied or rejected. People get thrown off their homes because of software. So be aware of this. <laughs> software kills. And it's, it's important. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I might sound like I'm making a joke, but it's not, unfortunately. And um, the part of this is uh, taken from the from this chapter one of my book. Um, if you are in .NET world and you're interested in domain design in practical aspects of it, you can you might want to read it. It will be out in January, but it's available now for early preview. Thank you very much. If you have questions, please come by because we don't have time. Uh, and uh, you can. Catch up with me on Twitter, and we have this nice um, DDD security event source in Slack channel, which cleans all the messages up to 10,000, so you, we don't pay for it, and you can write whatever you want, and it will vanish. Nobody knows that you wrote about your boss or your system. So thank you very much. <laughs>